I am at TAFOF 2023, one of the most significant annual events of the arts world, which occurs in Maastricht, the southernmost city in the Netherlands. The European Fine Arts Fair is among the largest and most significant arts fairs in the world, alongside Art Basel and Fries. For about one week in March at the MECC Convention Center, hundreds of prestigious art dealers come together here in Maastricht to showcase their historic and contemporary art pieces of every medium imaginable. But also, everything is for sale here at TAFOF. So many private art collectors and museums from around the globe attend TAFOF for one of the best opportunities of the year to purchase rare artwork. Outside the entrance there is a great floral display, the whole fair floor is enhanced by flowers everywhere among the tremendous art history on sale. I will not really go into detail on pricing, I'll just leave that to your imagination. The quality of artwork on sale here is amazing, there is a full vetting process for every item, so it is all genuine, and this was a really cool experience because this was my first foray into the arts market. This fair is unique because they do have authentic old master masterpieces available. At the same time, there are always works by big name modern artists, and a seemingly endless array of antiquities. Now let's head in and explore the wonders of Tefaf. Starting off with this commode that was owned by Marie Antoinette. It was delivered to Marie Antoinette at the Chateau de Campagne in 1770, along with a counterpart that is in the collection of Versailles. The commodes were the first new furnishings bought by the new French Queen. These 18th century jasper vases are quite rare in French decorative art. That is a portrait of Louis Charles d'Orléans, the Count of Beaujolais. This was a royal commission made by his brother, King Louis Philippe, for the Chateau d'Est. This is Fire in the Island by Carlo Bonavia, a tremendously detailed nocturne from 1758. The Gallery Perrin claims that this was the artist's most significant work. The painting on the right depicting St. Mark's Square in Venice is by Francesco Guardi, an important Venetian painter. So that was just the first gallery. There are over 200 to explore. And here's a map of the massive layout. This is going to take a while. This is a landscape with travelers by Jan Bruegel the Elder painted in 1606. He was a son of Peter Bruegel the Elder, known as the Velvet Bruegel for his incredibly refined brushwork. Here is an Impressionism gallery. In between two paintings by Eugene Boudin is a classic Degas dancer scene. This one is titled La Preparation pour la Classe. I would expect to work like this to be well established in a museum. Here is a great impressionistic work of Henry Moray called Lons de Pelote, Wassant. Moray is noted for his series of landscapes of Brittany and was involved with the Pontevan school. This is a pastel work of Camille Pissarro from 1879 titled Comieres à Auvers, Près de Pontoise a scene of thatched cottages near auvers sur oise France, similar to those painted a decade later by Van Gogh in his final months. Here is a scene by the great Dutch landscape artist Jan van Goyen from 1651. It's a view of Rupelmond Castle on the Scheldt. Here is a fantastic painting from 1625 by Peter Bruegel the Younger, another son of Peter Bruegel the Elder, whose peasant scenes were similarly chaotic like his father's. This is called the Swan Inn, peasants feasting and merrymaking in a village street. The Dickinson Gallery has some mind-boggling artwork of different eras on sale, such as this full-length Sargent portrait. John Singer Sargent was famous for his large portraits, and this one depicts Mrs. Edward Burkhart and her daughter Louise, who was perhaps the only real love interest of Sargent's life, this 1885 portrait was actually commissioned to support Sargent after the scandal of his Madame X in Paris damaged his reputation and career. And right next to that amazing Sargent portrait is a depiction of Saint Jerome by Antony van Dyck. This is an early work of the Flemish master from 1616. 
He made this when he was just 18 years old and was working with Peter Paul Rubens in Antwerp. Here is an acrylic work of David Hockney from 1979. And that is a drawing by Salvador Dali that he made for the American Weekly magazine in 1935. This commissioned illustration represents Dali's first impression of New York City. That is a still life with the yellow pot by Georges Braque. It's a latter and more mature work by the Cubist artist. It was started in 1945, but finished in 1962 shortly before his death. The Braque is contrasted by a late still life of the Nabi painter Pierre Bernard from 1930. Believe it or not, I am only showing some highlights. There are thousands upon thousands of historically significant pieces on the market at Tafoff this year. That is indeed a portrait by Franz Hals. He is considered as one of the greatest Dutch Golden Age painters, usually venerated about as highly as Rembrandt, and he made this portrait of Johann Klaus Lu in 1650. That is an interesting work of the Spanish artist Giuseppe de Ribera. It depicts a Roman philosopher. This is an outstanding piece by Benjamin West, an early American artist. This is titled Pyrrhus When a Child, brought by Glossius, King of Illyria, from 1767, when it was displayed by the Society of Artists in London. Here at Tafoff, representatives from art museums and private collectors go through and generally ask around for prices. The majority of galleries do not have set prices labeled. Some people come with specific missions in mind, and sometimes not. I do know for sure that people from the Museum of Fine Arts Houston were here, and that the Art Institute of Chicago bought five old master paintings this year. That is Le Cirque Les Cuillères, a 1957 painting by Marc Chagall. The theme of the circus often appeared in Chagall's works, as you would often see traveling circus acts in Vitebsk, Russia, while growing up there. Here is La Rue Rouge by Fernand Leger from 1920, a great little example of his unique cubist aka tubist style. The gallery next door also has a Chagall from the 1950s, depicting a horse jumping over the moon. Next to that is a little nude woman, painted by Pierre-Auguste Renoir in 1900. This gallery has a second Chagall, a sketch for a portrait de Vava made in 1966. That is an Henri Matisse drawing from 1928. There's an interesting work of Bridget Riley from 1974. She is a famous op artist. That is a tiny bronze cast of a Henry Moore. It is one of his iconic reclining women from the 80s. That is a great portrait by Renoir, the head of a blonde girl from 1908. Here is a wonderful little work by Joan Miro, titled The Flaming Heart Chases the Nights, made in 1965. There's another great Miro, a tribute to Antonio Machado from 1965, but you can tell that from the drawing itself. This is a fantastic painting by Salvador Dali. It is the Allegory of the Sea made in 1977. I even see a little Man of La Mancha in there. Next to that is a copy of Gala's Shoe also called a scatological object with symbolic function. That's quite the title. The original Dali sculpture from the 30s was destroyed, but this is an authentic copy. Here is another great Chagall circus scene that happens to be on the market. It is titled The Fiancé and the Circus from 1982. This one has a yellow donkey. The donkey symbolizes Chagall's daughter Ida. Those are small kinetic sculptures by Jean Tingley. I am surprised to see these here. Very cool. That is a silkscreen portrait by Andy Warhol. This gallery does not have any information about the works they sell, so I do not know who that is supposed to be. 
They also have a Calder Mobile. As well as this fantastic surreal piece by Rene Magritte. There's a Venus in a bottle, and the sky is cracking. Landau Fine Arts' display is amazing. All they have is artwork by important modern artists. Here is another great and rarely seen work of René Magritte. This is La Corde Sensible from 1960, with a cloud hovering above an oversized wine glass. Here is both a sculpture and a painting by Alberto Giacometti. While he is more so known for his sculptures, Monochrome paintings like that one titled Caroline from 1963 were prominent in his latter career. That's a 1927 work without a title by Yves Tongi. Here is the first Picasso I spotted at Tefaf, titled Marie Theresa, or Woman in an Armchair. He did this in 1927. That is an interesting Leger painted in 1921 called Le Grand Déjeuner. The Big Lunch, he was probably a bit inspired by Manet in this one. There is yet another Chagall, which is also a circus scene. That's a person by Joan Miro from 1935. This gallery alone is a mini modern art museum, and it is just one of over 270 galleries at Tefaf. Here are some small abstract compositions by Vasily Kandinsky. That's a Roy Lichtenstein from 1967, called A Modern Painting in Small Bolts. This is neat to see, a painting by the cutting-edge architect Le Corbusier, titled Menace from 1938. There's a Henry Moore sculpture of a figure on steps along with a great art brute example by Jean Dubuffet made in 1946. Here's another Picasso, the head of a man done in 1965. I really like this Miro, made in 1937 with gouache on paper. And here is a rare still life by Marc Chagall that he painted between 1910 and 1914. Here are some ancient Chinese bronze pieces, the next gallery over has medieval European art, such as this 13th century wood carved Catalan corpus of Christ. This is a magnificent reliquary casket made in Limoges, France around the year 1200. It is similar to the Mosin art style that was common here in Maastricht around that time. That is a 15th century gold plaque with quite a serious provenance as it was owned by the Rothschilds family for about two centuries. It is considered to be among the most refined examples of medieval enamel work. Some galleries in this convention space have fully reconstructed Baroque and Rococo interiors to display rare furnishings and decorative arts. This one is the Gallery Liage based in Paris, which specializes in objet d'art from the 17th century. That is a Louis XVI period mantle clock with Neptune and Diana. Here are some ancient Greek and Roman antiquities. And here's a Tibetan antique gallery. Here's an unexpected find a Cycladic idol head, carved sometime around 2500 BCE. David Aaron sells ancient Greek, Roman, Islamic, and even Egyptian antiquities. That is a Coptic grave steel, made sometime between the 8th and 10th century CE. This is pretty neat. The Bactrian Princess. This was carved out of chloride and calcite sometime between 2200 and 1900 BCE, discovered in what is now northern Afghanistan. This dealer sells ancient Roman sculpture and Picasso ceramics. That's an odd mix. 
There's a vase made by Pablo Picasso on the left, and a plate above that sarcophagus. This 3rd century CE marble sarcophagus has the gates of Hades on it. They even have a conveyor belt sushi bar in between the galleries. Here are some photographs by Annie Leibovitz, including a great photo of Keith Haring on the right, who painted the room and himself for it. This is a steel oval construction by Frantisek Kupka from 1927. And here are three playing cards by Picasso from 1914. This was inherited by the artist's granddaughter Marina Picasso, but she has now put it on the market. This is one of only nine impressions of Picasso's La Celestine, among his most original print compositions, featuring 66 different little scenes on it. That is a pastel on paper work by Edvard Munch from 1890, a scene of figures on the Seine at St. Cloud near Paris. Here is yet another Pablo Picasso drawing, a nude self-portrait with raised arm made in 1902, and it is next to a terracotta sculpture he did in 1950 of a woman with crossed arms that's probably supposed to be Francois Gillot. Here is a plaster head of a picador with a broken nose crafted by Picasso in 1903. And that on the right is a standing nude self-portrait by Pierre Bernard. This is an original lithograph by Roy Lichtenstein called Against Apartheid. He made this in 1983 as part of the Artists of the World Against Apartheid. Here's another Lichtenstein, a 1966 triptych titled As I Open Fire. The label on this one has a red dot, which means it has sold already. That is an original 1972 lithograph by Alexander Calder, inscribed by the artist himself. That's a Nan Golden photograph from the 90s. It's called Kim in her dressing room at the Carousel de Paris. That is a central post house galas made in Taiwan in the 16th century. Several galleries have great African art pieces, like these 19th century reliquary figures that were made in Cameroon. On the right is a Tija Wara crest from Mali. These are statues made by the Mamoye people in Nigeria. There's a little bar in the middle of the showroom floor surrounded by incredulously expensive artwork. They have a brand new Ai Weiwei on the market. He is a really interesting artist and works with all sorts of mediums, but I never knew he worked with Lego bricks. This is a Lego painting of Sleeping Venus built in 2022. And here's an Anish Kapoor called Monochrome from 2014. This is awesome, a monumental portrait by Kehinde Wiley. It's a Pieta scene featuring the YouTuber Tarek Ali Ellis holding Michael Morgan. Wiley must have just finished this in early 2023, and I did find out that this was sold for nearly $1 million here at Tefaf. And here is a similar Pieta inspired scene by Marina Abramovic. That is a great mini Alexander Calder sculpture, known as the Carousel from 1942. There are colored shards of glass hanging from the wires on top. Here's a work by Yayoi Kusama, perhaps the most popular contemporary Japanese artist, known for lots of dots and circles. This is a good example titled Infinity Nets from 1999. That is a painting by none other than Claude Monet. It's actually one of his more abstract ladder works, made between 1925 and 26 in Giverny. It is titled La Maison à Travers les Roses, a scene of Monet's house through the roses in his front garden. 
And there is a Henry Moore sculpture in front of it. Here is a 1927 work by the former Blau writer artist Gabriel Munter called Havanerkind. And this is Arnold, a 1983 abstract piece by Gerhard Richter. Here is yet another Calder. This sculpture is the curly blue tail from 1967. Here is another excellent Marc Chagall painting from the 1970s. It seems that a lot of Chagall artwork has emerged from private collections this year. Next to it is a painting on cardboard by Joan Miro. It's titled Oiseau Sans Volant, A Bird Flying from 1963. Here is a 1949 piece by the Dutch abstract artist Carol Apple of the Cobra Movement. That chair-like sculpture by Anish Kapoor was made in 1985. It is The Place. That's a Warhol screen print of Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. There's a Keith Haring illustration that he made in September of 1989. He used Sumi ink on black paper. The Haring is contrasted with a picture by Jean Dubuffet, also from the 80s. And there's another Chagall. I don't think I've ever seen so many Chagalls in my life. This is interesting. A mini replica of the Monument to Ferdinando I. It is a copy of the Monument of the Four Moors in Livorno, Italy, which depicts four more slaves chained onto the pedestal of the monuments. I mentioned that they do get some old masterworks, but I was not expecting to see a Tintoretto here, but sure enough they have one. This is a portrait of a scholar by the great Venetian master. That's an old man in the snow by Antonio Sofrondi. There's a great shipbuilding scene. There are many classic 18th century Venetian scenes at this gallery. This is the Bacino de San Marco towards San Giorgio Maggiore by Francesco Guardi. And this is the Bacino of San Marco looking west by Ken Aletto, perhaps the most iconic Venetian landscape painter. That is fantastic. And here's a depiction of Venice's mighty Rialto Bridge by Francesco Guardi. This is a basket of peaches and a plate of pears and apples on a stone ledge, a mouthful of a title by Juan de Zerberon. He was a Spanish Baroque painter known for still lifes like this. This is the interior of the Colosseum as it looked in 1862, when it was still largely abandoned and unexcavated. The old master's paintings on sale here are fantastic. This feels like an equivalent to a European art exhibit at a good art museum. I like how they display all these works in a random assortment like old-fashioned art galleries. This is a scene of the construction of the Tower of Babel by Martin van Valkenborsch, quite similar to the famous Towers of Babel by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Here is a wooden landscape opening onto a mountain range from the early 17th century by Denis van Ausloot. That is a portrait of Martin Luther by Lucas Cronach the Elder from the 1520s. The placard says in small print Cronach the Elder and Studio, so this may or may not have been done by the German master's own hand. Still, that's really awesome. And below it is another landscape by Jan Bruegel the Elder. I love this one. The Temptation of St. Anthony by Peter Hoys, who is obviously influenced by Hieronymus Bosch. That is magnificent. Here's a fantastic winter landscape with a bird trap by Peter Bruegel the Younger. A scene quite similar to his father's winter landscapes. This is the Garden of Earthly Delights, namely Hell, by an unknown follower of Hieronymus Bosch. There's all sorts of horrible torture going on here. This is an incredible still life by Jan Jans den Al and Jan Jans Trek made in Amsterdam. Man, that looks so real. 
Here is a pioneering landscape by Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot. It is called A Morning Haze on the Marsh from 1871. This is neat. A Venetian scene by Corot that he made in 1834. He visited in 1828 as part of his three year stay in Italy. This is an incredible painting made in the spirit of the Neo-Raphaelites. It is titled The Child and was painted by Thomas Edward Mostyn in 1912. This meticulously detailed work was displayed at the last Paris Salon before the Great War, where critical opinion was divided over this bold piece. Oh yeah, they also have medieval arms and armor on sale here. The armor on this horse and man was possibly made for Don Carlos de Aragona, the Spanish royal governor of Milan in the late 16th century. This heavy field armor was made in Augsburg by the Habsburg's court armorer Helmschmid. Here are some giant wheel lock pistols from the 1590s. And that's a little 18th century cannon. Some galleries offer historic cartography, including handcrafted Baroque globes. That is the San Zeno calendar made in 1455. It is a late medieval astronomical instrument. Here is a rare double hemisphere wall map of the world made by Giuseppe Longhi in Bologna around 1675. There's a big chunk of North America missing. There are several different dining options at Tefaf, including a self-service which is quite exquisite for a self-service, but there is also a Michelin-starred restaurant. This is a cabinet of curiosities display, a seemingly random assortment of treasures similar to the first private museums. One highlight is this Dutch cabinet, decorated with arabesque or seaweed marquetry and Turkish walnuts. That's a painted, gilt, and gem set tortoise shell made in Germany. Here are some more historic wooden globes. That ship model was made by French prisoners of war from the Napoleonic Wars. It even has retractable cannons. And here is a find with fascinating provenance, as this elaborate ceremonial hourglass is from the estate of Franz Liszt, one of the greatest pianists ever. He was quite the celebrity back in his day. That is an Ecce Homo from 1570 by Pablo Shepers, who was called Escort in Spain. And here is a Sorolla, a portrait of Maria Planas de Gilles that he made in Paris in 1906. That is a gold overlaid steel Safavid helmet from the 18th century. There are even medieval manuscripts here at Tefaf. This is a French political treatise made around 1455 with royal provenance. And this 13th century manuscript has fascinating decorations on every single page. This room for the most part is filled with fantastic Flemish tapestries. Well, one of these things is not quite like the others. That is a tapestry by Alexander Calder. I have never seen any of his tapestry designs before. This one is called the Whale Hunt. It was made in Brussels in the late 16th century. That is an astronaut made just this year by Feng Mengbo. I really like that. Here is a gallery full of Russian icons.
That's a late 17th century icon of St. Modestus and St. Blaise, the patron saints of cattle. And this fantastic icon is titled Anastasius, the Easter feast, with a double theme of the resurrection of Christ and the descent into hell. Of course, there's even samurai armor available for purchase. This is a great 18th century samurai armor set. This gallery specializes in Javanese arts, including lots of historic sculptures of gods such as Ganesha. This is a Balinese gold necklace inlaid with precious stones. Here is a portrait of Napoleon in his study at the Tuileries Palace, made in 1815. This was painted by an Englishman, John Hayes, after a Jacques-Louis David portrait. This is the Death of Demosthenes, painted in 1805 by Georges Rouget. This painting was inside the artist's studio at his death. La Pendulerie is a Paris-based seller of antique clocks. This gallery topped their space with a 17th century ceiling transplanted from northern Portugal. I wonder how much that ceiling goes for. That's an ivory and silver jewelry box made in Ceylon, present day Sri Lanka in the mid 17th century. Many of these galleries are beautifully laid out. A lot of effort goes into making this fair look great even though it's only open for about a week to 10 days. This is a Tibetan cloth depiction of the Buddha from the 12th century. Here is a display of splendid antique clocks. This gallery specializes in antique musical instruments. this American Civil War era banjo, which has a Union soldier painted on the skin. I found an otherworldly room displaying high-end jewelry. I wasn't kidding. They have a lot of flowers everywhere. It's a really nice touch. Back into another section with great modern artwork. That is a Cubist cup and pipe made in 1914 by Juan Gris. And this is the memory of what has been suffered, painted in 1931 by Paul Clay. This room features a group of works by Cy Twombly, made in 1963. This is the head of a woman by Joan Miro from 1966. Here is a rare book retailer. They really do have everything at Tefaf. All right, this gallery has some more modern works. That is a study for a bull by Pablo Picasso. Here is a fantastic piece by Jean Dubuffet called Ne Robinet. He made this one in 1961, and unlike most galleries, they are open about the price. It costs $5 million excluding taxes. That's Conjectures by Dubuffet, dated from 1964. That is an Alberto Giacometti painting from 1947 depicting his mother. This is a woman with apron made by Picasso in 1949. Here's yet another Dubuffet, 
Personage Paysage from 1962. This is a sketch portrait of a woman by Henri Matisse made in 1947. There's a nude man laying down. A crayon drawing by Pablo Picasso done in 1967. As he once said, it took him a lifetime to learn to draw like a child. This is another crayon drawing by Picasso. A 1969 nude and seated man. I really enjoy this cow in a red hat by Fernand Leger. This 1952 painting is probably my favorite Leger piece now. I wonder where it might end up. This is a nice painting by Edouard Villard, Sous le Portique, or On the Portico, which he made around the turn of the 20th century. There's a beautiful Madonna relief carved in 15th century Florence. That is a Dutch portrait. And a bust of Delacroix. This is Christ at the Column. A terracotta modello that was used in the studio of Filippo Parodi, Genoa's greatest Baroque sculptor. I've said it once and I'll say it again, this place is mind-boggling. I cannot believe what I'm seeing here. Here's a classic Arnaldo Pomodoro sphere. It's a little tiny one. This dealer has brought some fantastic sculptures. This is The Vision, a portrait of Dante and Beatrix made by the Romantic Parisian artist Ari Schaeffer. This is a 1635 ceremonial silver gilt ewer that once belonged to a Rothschild. This is wonderful. Le Boulevard des Italiens in Paris as it looked in 1889. That is a still life by the post-impressionist Henri Le Sedaner. Here is another Antony van Dyck. The Penitent St. Peter from 1616. He made this around the same time as the other Van Dyke we saw for sale here. This is one of the highlights of Tefaf 2023. The Virgin and the Sash painted in 1660 by Bartolome Esteban Murillo, one of the most important Spanish Baroque painters. This was actually owned by King Louis Philippe of France. And apparently this is the second time that this dealer, Kolnagi, has ended up selling this historic and beautiful painting. And that's a Roman head. There's St. Sebastian and St. Rocco by Bernardo Strozzi. This is a haunting Pieta by Luis de Morales, known as El Divino. This is the head of a young satyr from Imperial Rome. Here's a gallery specializing in British art. This is a landscape drawn by Thomas Gainsborough in 1786. And this Gainsborough sketch is called Returning from Market. I can see that it has a long history of being part of exhibitions, but it may find a more permanent home now. Here is a small John Constable landscape that he made in 1822. It's called Storm Clouds Over Hampstead. This is the Triumph of Neptune with the Fruits of the Sea by Paul DeVos. That huge canvas is the launch of the Argo with elements of academism and symbolism. This is Christ Before Caiaphas by Luca Cambiasso, one of the most innovative mannerist painters from the 16th century. This is a marvelous nativity by Jakob Ernst Thoman von Hagelstein, painted on copper in 1605. He was a revolutionary artist who is nearly forgotten. 
This gallery has authentic prints and drawings by famous artists, such as this gouache from Joan Miro's Savage Painting series. This is Daphnis and Chloe by Marc Chagall, portraying an ancient Greek romance story. This is an etching experiment by Chagall from 1924, of a nude with a fan. And here's a smiling self-portrait by Marc Chagall from 1924. This is the earliest known impression by Chagall in private hands. This is a pastel by Mary Cassatt, featuring two of her favorite models. They even have an Alfred Cecily painting from 1879, a farmyard in Cheville. This is a woodcut print by Edward Monk titled Moonlight, depicting an older married woman who may have had an illicit affair with a young artist. Those are iconic Monk prints of the Madonna and the Kiss. This is a drawing by Emidio Medigliani, a red caryatid on black background. Here is yet another Matisse drawing of Lydia Delectorskaya, his favorite model and muse in 1935. This is an Edgar Degas lithograph titled After the Bath. This is a self-portrait with palette by Marc Chagall made in 1917. He likely made this on his return to his childhood home of Vitebsk in the year of the Russian Revolution. He said at that time that since Lenin had turned his country's sense of top and bottom upside down, he would start inverting his pictures as he did here. Here is a painting by the leading Fauvist André Duran, depicting the Port of Collioure, which he painted a lot. This 1905 work was originally owned by the important modern art dealer Amboise Villard. This is a portrait of Meyer de Haan, also called Melancholy, by Paul Gauguin. Meyer de Haan was a Dutch painter who knew Gauguin and the Van Goghs, though he didn't become as famous. This gallery has a great collection of primarily late 19th century French art, especially watercolors. This is Les Saucis, an 1862 piece by Gustave Courbet. I definitely did not expect to see a Courbet here. This is The Path Going Under the Trees by Corot from 1874. Those are the piers at low tide at Trouville, a classic Normandy scene painted by one of the region's most important artists, Eugène Boudon. Here is The Vue de la Madrague by André Durand from 1922. That's a Daubigny landscape of the White Cliffs at Dover, next to a Corot landscape. This is a unique watercolor by Camille Pissarro, depicting Chatelain sur Seine. It is juxtaposed with a watercolor by Raoul Dufy, made half a century later. There's a bird, a watercolor and gouache on paper from 1950 by Duran. Here is a 1930 scene of Onfleur by Paul Signac. And they have plenty more Signac and Dufy watercolors. And finally, this is the Dream of Don Ramiro, a panel by Luca Giordano. So that was Tafoff 2023. I am about as beyond impressed as one can be. I definitely did not get to see all of it. Again, there were over 270 galleries, so really it could take days to go through. The immense variation of not just artwork, but good and interesting historic and new artwork, all out for sale here was an incredible experience to explore and be a part of. This was definitely one of the coolest events of my life, so a big thanks to those who invited me and made this video possible, and to Tefa for allowing me to share their extraordinary fare and efforts. If you are interested in learning more about Tefaf, or even attending one of their events, then check their website www.tefaf.com. You can check their website for the full list of dealers, as well as the schedule for Tefaf Maastricht 2024, which will occur in March, along with information about the smaller scale Tefaf event which occurs annually in New York City. It is possible for anyone to visit Tefaf Maastricht or New York and explore the immense global heritage on display for yourself. This was a rare chance to see many of the pieces we saw here. Many come from private collections and will go into private collections. So that aspect alone is really awesome. I do certainly hope to return to Tafoff in future years. If you are interested in seeing more content, I have videos on all sorts of art museums, exhibitions, and other types of attractions and events here in Europe and in the United States. 
I did make some episodes on the fascinating and unique city of Maastricht as well, and those are linked in the video description. Also, please click the like button, share this video, and subscribe to my channel for more. Thanks for watching!